Well, welcome back to the 30th annual Westheimer Peace Symposium at Wilmington College in Wilmington, Ohio. This is our annual Westheimer Peace Symposium focusing on peace and the nature of war through a special two-day symposium entitled The Nuclear Threat, Past, Present, and Future in commemoration of the 75th anniversary of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan by the United States. This year's symposium is a special collaboration of our, uh, with the Wilmington College Peace Resource Center, which holds an extensive collection of archival materials related to the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the human experience of nuclear war. It is also in collaboration with the Response Project, funded by an Ohio Arts Council grant in which seven artists across the United States have created original compositions for the symposium, symposium in response to archival materials from the Peace Resource Center archives. For a full schedule of today's and tomorrow's lectures and performances, please go to wilmington.edu backslash Westheimer. My name is Tanya Moss, and I am the director of the Peace Resource Center at Wilmington College, and I'm your host for this afternoon's plenary lecture entitled Beneath the Mushroom Cloud, Life After Nuclear War. In my role as host, I'm here to welcome you, briefly introduce our speaker, and be on hand to field questions and comments when needed. A huge thank you goes to our plenary presenter today, Susan Southard. Ms. Southard is an author and lecturer, among many other wonderful things. Her first book, Nagasaki, Life After Nuclear War, Viking Press 2015, received the Dayton Literary Peace Prize in nonfiction and the J. Anthony Lucas Book Prize, sponsored by the Columbia School of Journalism and Harvard University's Neiman Foundation for Journalism. Nagasaki was also named a best book of the year by the Washington Post, The Economist, Kirkus Reviews, and the American Library Association. Southern holds an MFA in creative writing from Antioch University, Los Angeles, and was a nonfiction fellow at the Norman Mailer Center in Prince Provincetown, Massachusetts. Southern presents keynote addresses and lectures at new international nuclear disarmament conferences universities and public forums across the United States and abroad. In 2016, she spoke before the United Nations on behalf of the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, which won the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize. Ms. Southern, I welcome you and I turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes. My, oh, now I can start, here we go. There we are. Hi, everybody. <laughs> thank you so much, Tanya. And I'd also like to thank Mary and Bill Westheimer for their continuing support of May and Charles Westheimer's vision for this symposium. Tanya for coordinating this important event and inviting me to participate. And everyone who contributed their time and expertise to make this symposium possible. I'd also like to express my really deep appreciation to Ellen O'Hara and Napoleon Maddox, two of the artists who just presented their work in the last artist response session. I didn't get to see the third one because I had to log on here, but I'll see it at the next session that it's presented. I found those works so remarkably moving and both inspiring and um, tear inducing. Thank you so much. My book, Nagasaki Life After Nuclear War, tells the story of five survivors of the Nagasaki atomic bombing, all teenagers at the time of the bombing, and follows their lives and the life of the whole city over the next 70 years. Today, I'd like to explore the theme of remembering and forgetting. That is what we as Americans remember and what we choose to forget, which is so relevant to much of our nation's history that's been denied, distorted, and silenced. Allowing us as Americans to habitually turn away from, to forget the extraordinary suffering many of our actions have caused to people in our own country and abroad. That's certainly true for Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which in the United States at least 
have been so powerfully justified and mythologized that even now, 75 years later, most Americans know very little about what happened to the people in those two cities, most all of whom were civilians. As if their stories are not a part of our own history as a nation and as part of the global community. It's in this spirit of understanding this history and holding it in our memory that I'll tell you a few of these stories and read a few excerpts from my book to show you what happened beneath Nagasaki's mushroom cloud and the long aftermath of nuclear war. I think at the end we'll have time for a few questions as well. So now I'm gonna to switch to screen share. Let's see if we can get there. Here we are. And thank you for your patience on that. I'd like to take you back to Japan, 1945, where the narrative of nuclear war began. By that time, the Pacific War started by Japan when it bombed Pearl Harbor had been raging for three years and eight months. And as Japan's depleted military kept pushing forward in its brutal conquest of East Asia and many Pacific Island nations, in the United States, the world's first atomic bombs were rushed to completion and shipped to a small island in the South Pacific to await their missions. Meanwhile, in Japan, US and allied bombers had attacked and destroyed all or major parts of 64 Japanese cities, killing an estimated 183,000 civilians, including in Tokyo, where firebombing attacks in March 1945 killed 100,000 people in one night. Across Japan, people were starving, and the only news they heard about the war was government propaganda. The Nagasaki bombing was the third in a series of huge military events that happened very quickly in early, 19, in early August 1945. First, as many of you know, on August 6, 1945, the United States dropped the first nuclear weapon used in warfare on Hiroshima. You can see it here on the map, killing approximately 140,000 civilians. Second, two and a half days later, at midnight on August 9, 1945, the Soviet Union joined the Allies against Japan by sending 1.5 million troops on three fronts across the border of Japanese-held Manchuria, which is located in this region here. This was an invasion that the Japanese military could not fend off. The next morning, Japanese military and government leaders convened an emergency meeting in Tokyo to heatedly debate the terms of surrender, but they couldn't agree and they remained deadlocked throughout the day and evening. Only 30 minutes after that meeting had started, the Nagasaki bomb was dropped just after 11 a.m. So that's 11 hours after the Soviet invasion. News of the bombing quickly reached the Japanese leaders in Tokyo, but by all accounts, the Nagasaki attack had no impact on their continuing debates or on the emperor's ultimate decision to surrender. This here is the island of Kyushu. It's Japan's southernmost main island. Nagasaki is on the west coast of Kyushu, a port city built around a long narrow bay with lush green hills on three sides. In 1945, the population of Nagasaki was 240,000 people. This is a photograph of the Urakami Valley. It's the northern section of Nagasaki. Uh, and you can see that in 1945, it was packed with houses, shops, factories, and schools. The Urakami Church in the middle was the largest in the Far East. In 1945, 20,000 people in Nagasaki were Catholics. The bomb fell about here, which is about one and a half miles to give you some perspective from where the photographer was standing. That morning, August 9th, was sunny and hot. As the US B-29 bomber carrying the bomb approached Nagasaki, in the city below, men, women, and children were digging cave-like air raid shelters into hillsides 
to ward against, uh, to protect themselves against what they thought were, would be a traditional bombing attacks. They were hanging laundry, they were lining up at ration stations, and they were scouring the hills for weeds to boil into soup for their families. These are the five survivors whose stories I tell in my book. By 1944, Japanese law required all children over the age of 14 to leave school and work for the war effort. So these four here, Wada-san, Taniguchi-san, Nagano-san, and Do-san were all working for the war effort as a streetcar driver, a postal delivery boy, and the two girls were working in munitions factories. And this is Yoshida Katsuji. Um, we're gonna focus on his story today. And he was only 13 at the time of the bombing, so he was still in school. This photograph was taken a few years before that, so I estimate that he's about 10 in this photograph. You'll hear about him at the end of this first excerpt, which begins at 11.01 that morning, the moment when, from six miles above the city, the USB-29 bomber opened its bomb bay doors and released the bomb. The five-ton plutonium bomb plunged toward the city at 614 miles per hour. 47 seconds later, the bomb detonated a third of a mile above the Urakami Valley and its 30,000 residents and workers. At 11.02 a.m., a super brilliant flash lit up the sky, followed by a thunderous explosion equal to the power of 21,000 tons of TNT. The entire city convulsed. At its burst point, the center of the explosion reached temperatures higher than at the center of the sun, and the velocity of its shockwave exceeded the speed of sound. Within three seconds, the thermal heat of the bomb caused the ground below, excuse me, the ground below it to reach an estimated 5,400 to 7,200 degrees Fahrenheit. Infrared heat rays instantly carbonized human and animal flesh and vaporized internal organs. As the atomic cloud billowed two miles overhead and eclipsed the sun, the bomb's vertical blast pressure crushed much of the Urakami Valley. Horizontal blast winds tore through the region at two and a half times the speed of a category five hurricane. In every direction, people were blown out of their shelters, houses, factories, schools, and hospital beds, catapulted against walls or flattened beneath collapsed buildings. Those working in the fields, riding streetcars and standing in line at city ration stations were blown off their feet or hit by plummeting debris and pressed to the scalding earth. As their buildings began to implode, patients and staff jumped out of the windows of Nagasaki Medical College Hospital and mobilized high school girls leapt from the third story of Shiroyama Elementary School a half mile from the blast. The blazing heat melted iron and other metals, scorched brick and concrete buildings, ignited clothing, disintegrated vegetation, and caused severe and fatal flash burns on people's exposed faces and bodies, even up to two miles away. At distances up to five miles, wood and glass splinters pierced through people's clothing and ripped into their flesh. Windows shattered as far as 11 miles away. Larger doses of radiation than any human had ever experienced penetrated deeply into the bodies of people and animals. A deafening roar erupted as buildings throughout the city shuddered and crashed to the ground. It all happened in an instant, 13-year-old Yoshida remembered. He was standing next to a roadside well and had barely seen the blinding light half a mile away before a powerful force hit him on his right side and hurled him into the air. The heat was so intense that I curled up like surume, dried grilled squid, he said. In what felt like dreamlike slow motion, Yoshida was blown backward 130 feet across a field, a road, and an irrigation channel, then plunged to the ground, landing on his back in a rice paddy flooded with shallow water. Beneath the still rising mushroom cloud, a huge portion of Nagasaki had vanished. Tens of thousands throughout the city were dead or injured. Among them, Yoshida lay barely conscious in the muddy rice paddy, his body and face brutally scorched. 60 seconds had passed. <laughs> 
These are two aerial shots of the hypocenter area taken by the US military. The one on top is two days before the bombing when that part of the city still existed. And the one on the bottom is three days after when the whole part of that city was gone. And you can see that the hypocenter is here. You can see it, but it's this, um, it's right next to the, um, the stadium here. To give you a heads up, the next two photos were taken in the atomic ruins the day after the bombing. And I'd like to warn you that they're very grim. This was taken at the hypocenter, excuse me, near the hypocenter at 2 p.m. the next day. So about 27 hours after the nuclear blast. Near the center here is an air raid shelter dug into the ground. And you can see in the foreground, the corpses of scorched bodies frozen in place as they fell. In the background, these are the smokestacks of, the Mitsubishi, of one of the Mitsubishi factories. And um, difficult to see, but on this hillside over here are the ruins of the Chinze Middle School. Over the next year and a half, oh, excuse me, I, I skipped something here, I'm sorry. I have something incorrect here. Here it is, I'm sorry. This next photo is one of survivors uh, that day who had gathered at a relief station near Nagasaki's main road, just over a mile from the hypocenter. The blanket the survivors are sitting on came from rescue workers who took it from a damaged inn. The casualty count in Nagasaki at the end of 1945, 74,000 people killed, 75,000 more injured and irradiated. Collectively, these people, both in Nagasaki and Hiroshima, became known as hibaksha, which means atomic bomb affected people. So my question is, who remembers them and who forgets? For most Americans, the historical image of the atomic bombs has been, and still is, a mushroom cloud rising high above the city of Nagasaki or Hiroshima, an, an image that doesn't capture what happened to people of those two cities beneath the mushroom clouds. For most Americans, the bombings are seen as abstract events of the past, military actions that ended the Pacific War. But for Hibaksha, there is nothing abstract about nuclear war. And for many, the war never ended. This next short excerpt that I'll read describes the first terrifying signs of whole body radiation exposure in Nagasaki. At this point in the story, Japan has surrendered, but US occupation forces haven't arrived yet. You'll hear the name Dr. Akizuki. He was a young physician who had a second, who was a secondary character in my book. Before the bombing, he was the director of a 70 bed tuberculosis hospital near the hypocenter. Only the skeleton of the building seen here remained after the bombing. And I'd like to warn you again, some of the descriptions about how radiation affected people are quite intense. Within a week of the bombing, thousands of men, women, and children across Nagasaki and the surrounding region began to experience inexplicable combinations of symptoms, high fever, dizziness, loss of appetite, nausea, headaches, diarrhea, bloody stools, nosebleeds, whole body weakness and fatigue. Their hair fell out in large clumps, their burns and wounds secreted extreme amounts of pus and their gums swelled, became infected and bled. Purple spots appeared on their bodies, sign, signs of hemorrhaging beneath the skin and infections were rampant throughout their bodies. Within a few days of the appearance of their initial symptoms, many people lost consciousness, mumbled deliriously and died in extreme pain. Others languished for weeks before either dying or slowly recovering. Even those who had suffered no external injuries fell sick and died. From his perspective, from his burned out hospital on top of Motuhara Hill, death carved a clear geographical path. 
The first people who suffered and died from radiation related illness were living inside an air raid shelter at the bottom of the hill, closer to the hypocenter, so they received higher doses of radiation. The illness then climbed the hill, killing people in relative order according to their distance from the atomic blast. Dr. Akizuki named this widening advance of the disease the concentric circles of death. Fear gripped the city. Countless more died one after the other, still mystified, confused, and terrified about the invisible power of the bomb. Dr. Akizuki likened the situation to the Black Death pandemic that devastated Europe in the 1300s. This is a photo of a classroom inside a partially damaged elementary school that was used for months as a temporary relief hospital. The patients are lying on the floor on top of mats and surviving medical personnel in Nagasaki and vol volunteers from outside the city are treating them. Meanwhile, in the first weeks and months after the bombings, high level officials in the United States adamantly and publicly refuted news reports out of Hiroshima and Nagasaki that large numbers of people were suffering and dying from radiation exposure. In late August and early September 1945, for example, General Leslie Groves, director of the Manhattan Project where the atomic bombs were developed, tried to deflect public discussion about the bomb's radiation effects by insisting on the lawfulness of the bomb's use and their decisive role in ending the war. The atomic bomb is not an inhuman weapon, he stated in the New York Times. I think our best answer to anyone who doubts this is that we did not start the war, and if they don't like the way we ended it, to remember who started it. Later that year, General Groves testified before the US Senate that death from high dose radiation exposure is, quote, without undue suffering and a very pleasant way to die, close quote. Over the next two years, top US leaders censored the Japanese press from reporting on Nagasaki and Hiroshima, limited American media coverage of the human impact of the bombings, and launched a media campaign to quell growing public criticism of the bombings and promote public support for further US nuclear weapons development. The campaign culminated in an extended article on the decision to use the bomb written by former Secretary of War Henry Stimson published in Harper's Magazine in February 1947. Unbeknownst to everyday Americans, the article was filled with numerous misstatements and omissions, effectively forging a singular atomic bomb narrative with such moral certitude that it has superseded all others and fundamentally shaped American memory and percep perception since then, that the atomic bombings ended the war and saved a million American lives. All of this with no mention of what happened to the men, women, and children beneath the mushroom clouds. Back in Nagasaki, the effects of the bomb didn't stop. In the nine months after the bombing, many women who were pregnant at the time of the bombing lost their babies, and many babies who suffered, who survived, um, who, excuse me, and many babies who survived birth developed physical and mental disabilities. For years, people lived in the ruins and flimsy shacks built on top of charred fragments of human bone, caring for their injured, irradiated, and dying loved ones, even as they themselves were often injured or ill. And then, because of their, irrad their radiation exposure, in 1948, three years after the bombing, leukemia and other cancer rates began to spike across the city, causing more deaths and initiating a cycle of surging cancer rates that would last for decades. Now I'd like to tell you a little bit about Yoshida Katsuji, one of the survivors in my book. I met him, uh, I first met him when he was in his 70s and he was a, one of the most charming and kind and hilarious men I've ever known. Here he is again when he was about 10 years old. And to remind you, he was 13 at the time of the bombing and was thrown back 130 feet and landed in a rice paddy. Because he had been facing the bomb, his entire face and much of his neck were scorched. 
Over the next year and a half, he went, underwent three skin graft surgeries to his face. The next photos of his charred face are really, really terrible. So um, take a breath. On the left is uh, the photograph of him before one of his skin graft surgeries. And on the right is a photograph right after of that surgery. He um, was still severely disfigured when he returned home uh, from the hospital in early 1947. And Yoshida, like so many other disfigured hibaksha, hid in his house for years, rarely venturing to go outside for fear of people's stares. But eventually, he had to find a job to help support his family. Here he is in 1950 when he was 19. Notice the 1950s hairstyle there. The final excerpt I'll read tells the story of Yoshida by then in his 50s, the first time he told his story publicly and how he spoke to children about his experiences. You can see here that he wore a large black patch to cover the right side of his head. This was to cover the spot where his right ear had been because that ear had melted off at the time of the bombing and scar tissue covered his face and neck. Although Yoshida admired the hibaksha who chose to speak publicly and thought of them as pioneers, he himself remained silent. I was shy to be in front of people, especially women. Everyone looked at me like this, he grimaced. I didn't like it. One day, however, a good friend approached Yoshida to ask if he could take his place at a talk he was scheduled to give at a junior high, uh, give to junior high school students visiting Nagasaki. Yoshida agreed, but when he arrived at the site and saw all the students staring at him, he immediately regretted it. Unraveled by the students' fear of making eye, eye contact with him and what he thought was their revulsion, Yoshida stood before them and told his story. Some students began crying, and when Yoshida looked up at them, he nearly burst into tears himself. Afterward, many of the children expressed their appreciation to him. Yoshida, however, was so shaken by the experience that he returned momentarily to silence. But not for long. In his ongoing effort to accept his disfigurement, Yoshida came to terms with the fact that he could not change what had happened to him or how he looked. And he decided no longer to let his shyness get in the way of speaking out for peace. Outside the Nagasaki Atomic Bomb Museum in 2007, Yoshida turns toward the crowds of uniformed, talkative students lining up for tours and presentations by survivors. He locates the group of students that is scheduled to hear his story that day, greets the head teacher, then races to the head of the line to hold the museum door open for the class, urging them inside until the last child has entered. Now, he says, beaming, 9.5 out of 10 children don't cry when they see my face. To help the students feel comfortable, for years, Yoshida has joked that he is as good looking as Kimutaku, a handsome Japanese pop star from the 1990s. Now, however, Kimutaku, still a handsome for actor in his 40s, no longer evokes the humorous comparison Yoshida intends. A colleague suggested that he update the actor he compares himself to but Yoshida has never done so, except once in Chicago, when he likened his incredible good looks to those of Leonardo DiCaprio. In Nagasaki, when children ask him for his autograph after his talks, he signs it, Grandpa Yoshida, and then adds in parentheses, Grandpa Kimutaku. This is what I say to children, he explains. Have you ever looked up Heiwa, peace, in the dictionary? They never have. They've never looked it up because we don't need to know what peace is during peacetime. Let's look it up together, he says to the children. He pauses and adds emphatically, our greatest enemy is carelessness. We need to pay attention to peace. So I'd like to ask again in 2020, 75 years after the bombings, why does it matter for us to understand and remember the survivors' stories? 
First, the obvious reason that the injury, irradiation, and deaths of these civilians took place at our hands. But their stories matter for other reasons as well. They matter because nearly 13,500 nuclear weapons exist in the world today, far more powerful than those used on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. About 9,500 of them are actively deployed or stockpiled across the globe, waiting and ready for use upon command. Especially in today's volatile political climate, whether by intentional military use, nuclear accident, or an act of terrorism, right now we are at enormously high risk for far worse humanitarian and environmental disasters than Nagasaki and Hiroshima. The survivor stories matter because as long as these weapons exist, we must imagine and understand what nuclear war really is. And Hibakusha are the only people in history who can tell us firsthand what these weapons do. Their stories matter because what most Americans learn about the bombings, that they ended the war and saved a million or more American lives, has allowed so many Americans for 75 years to ignore, minimize, or justify the other half of the story. How can we make sound decisions about our future if we don't examine and understand the full consequences of our past actions? As Hibaksha age and their voices fade, their stories matter because they invite us to understand how fiercely we must imagine and manifest peace without nuclear weapons. Hibaksha have lived this long history. I strongly believe that it's our responsibility to know and remember this history, not only because we are the nation that inflicted this egregious harm, but also because not only Hibaksha, but we too want to ensure that Nagasaki is the last atomic bombed city in history. Thank you. I'll stop screen sharing now. And I think we have time for a few questions and I don't know whether that'll be Tanya or Ashley. Well, I was waiting for Tanya's response but she may have had to step away. Um, Let's see, so we have a couple of questions on Facebook. Um, first of all, um, what were the different emotions that you experienced when writing this book? Was dealing with these emotions challenging when trying to focus on writing the book? Wow, the short answer is yes, they were challenging. Um, there were times when I just simply had to stop and take a break for a couple of days in my research or in my transcribing or translating the, the Hibaksha stories. Um, uh, but I had a couple of really strong motivating factors that helped me get through my own emotional uh, responses and persevere. It was a 12 year project. Um, one of them was that I had grown to really care about and love the five survivors stories, uh, five survivors who, who I, whose stories I tell and many more survivors and uh, people in Nagasaki who helped me with my research. And um, the second was that I had made a commitment to tell their stories and I was not gonna let them down. And so it really helped me. The other thing is that writing a book is so much, at least this book, there was so much history, so much research, thousands and thousands of pages of, of documents to sift through and then figure out how to organize that it uses a different part of uh, one's brain so it helped a lot, that helped a lot too, to, um, to not always have me staying in my heart and body during the most uh, difficult times. Okay, great. So I'm sorry, I had to step out for just a second. That's okay. But I see we have some questions coming in. We just had one, Tanya. About the dealing sort of with the traumatic nature of, of yeah. writing this kind of material. Yes. Great. So I'm wondering, um, 
how you continue yourself to engage with this material. So, um, so the book itself is, you know, you've, yeah. you've finished the book and have you, con have, do you go back to Nagasaki? Do you continue to do research in this area? Are you, you know, sort of moving forward in that way? Yes, uh, thanks. Um, I, I'm not continuing research except to follow the nuclear weapons ban treaty progress and to follow the current uh, affairs of nuclear weapons. I'm not very knowledgeable, but I, I follow it as best I can. But I do speak publicly all over the world um, in person or by Zoom. And um, I have been back to Nagasaki. So the book was published five years ago. I've had the great fortune to go back to Nagasaki four times. Um, since then, the last was in that last November uh, when the city, the book was finally published in Japanese last year and the city invited me back for a series of um, uh, public uh, lectures and talks and it was in Japanese, which was cra crazily hard for me. I'm not like you, Tanya. And, uh, <laughs> and um, I, I, it's been a great, great pleasure. And since the book was published in, Jap in Japanese, the people of Nagasaki know better what I was working on for 12 years. I think sometimes they, they wondered if this book was ever gonna get finished. We had a speaker and there's a couple questions waiting and I'll, I'll get to those very shortly. There's, we had a speaker in, in my previous workshop that said that a lot of the energy and activism has moved to Nagasaki um, according to her impression. Um, this was an atomic bombing sufferer who spoke um, in the previous workshop. And I'm wondering if you find that to be true and if it's changed since you started working on this at all, or, um, and if, if it has, you know, what are the reasons for that? I have to say that I don't think I know the answer to that question, those questions. Um, I, um, when I started the research, I, I was working so hard for, for many years, interviewing the survivors and, uh, translating their interviews and doing the research and then writing the book that I wasn't following the growth of activism. However, and I don't know the difference between Nagasaki and Hiroshima's activism. However, I do know that Nagasaki is really, really active. I just did a wonderful seminar last week with the, sponsored by the city with four Nagasaki high school students and four US high school students. Um, and a 93-year-old survivor who had just started learning English and at the age of 90 told his story uh, in English uh, to uh, the American students. And we had a two-hour discussion together. Um, and there are many great student activists in, in the city as well. So that's what I can tell you that I know for sure. Uh, I think you're muted, Tanya. Thank you. We had um, a, another question, um, who in the story, and I, I know this is a question you've been asked be many times because people are really wondering about your engagement with the, with the various atomic bombing sufferers in the story, who created the deepest impression on you um, in, while you were writing this book? You know, asking that question for some reason, it brings tears to me because, um, each of the five are so different. And uh, Mr. Taniguchi, whose whole back was burned off, uh, he was the postal delivery boy. He was quiet and very subdued, but there was a, an, a kind of an underlying anger that I sensed beneath that. And um, Mr. Wada, beautiful, sweet, loving man. Um, Mrs. Nagano, who uh, experienced great tragedy in her family and um, still now, it, I think she's 92 or 93, you know, cries whenever she tells her story. And um, Mr. Yoshida, who I told a little bit about my impression and, and then Mrs. Doe, who's one of the most magnificent, strong, independent, fiercely strong women that I've ever met. And so for very different reasons, they all hold a very unique, um, place that penetrated my whole life and my heart. Thank you. Um, a comment, uh, thank you, Susan. I appreciate your sensitivity and your connection to the five people you became close to. This presentation is necessary and will stay with me. Mm, thank you. A question, 
Um, how did you actually come upon these survivors and these atomic bombing sufferers in the first place? That's a really interesting question. Uh, thank you. The, um, the first survivor, Mr. Taniguchi, the one I told you who, whose back had been burned off, I met many years earlier, 1986, when he was speaking in uh, Washington, D.C., where I, where I lived at the time. And through a series of bizarre little concert, uh, things that happened, I ended up being his unskilled interpreter for two days of, of the last two days of his stay in D.C. So I got to know him then and got to listen to his story for hours in between his public presentations. And I stayed in touch with him over the years. And so I knew I wanted his story to be in the book. And when I approached the city of Nagasaki on my very first trip, research trip for the book in 2003, I was introduced to, to Ms. Mr. Wada and Mrs. Doe. And then I, I went home and I didn't go back for four years. And as I researched and read 300 more survivors' testimonies, I realized that I needed a, a, a survivor's story who, whose family was deeply affected um, because the three people whose stories I already knew I was going to tell, that, that was not part of their story. And I mean, personally. And then I needed someone who was physically disfigured because both of those things were very, very common as part of the larger story of, of, of post-nuclear survival. So I had to research who was still alive and I had to research their stories. And I found Mr. Yoshida, whose story I briefly mentioned today, and I found Mrs. Nagano, whose, sto whose story is very much a family story. And I was introduced to them by one of the or uh, kind of public uh, governmental partnerships um, uh, who, uh, who uh, have a speakers bureau of survivors and, I, and they helped me find these um, survivors and set up appointments. Susan, another person has asked us, is it common for most survivors to want to share their story with you or with anyone? No, it's not. The five survivors who I, um, whose stories I told all chose, uh, they were among a very small number in Nagasaki who chose to tell their stories publicly as a sense of duty to use their uh, experience and their suffering to help eliminate nuclear weapons. But across the city, and I believe this is true in Hiroshima as well, um, most survivors never speak about it. And they don't, some of their, for years, many times their spouses may not have known and their children, they never spoke about it with their children or grandchildren either. Susan, um, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, uh, some of the folks have commented on how incredible those images are, you know, deeply, disturbing um, images that we don't always get to see because of the depth of the research that you've done. So thank you so much um, for leaving us with, you know, the reminders, the important reminders of, of that we need to be attentive and work toward abolishing these kinds of weapons of mass destruction um, by listening to the stories of those who encountered nuclear war. And um, we'll close for today. If folks have additional questions, it may be possible for Susan to go look at the Facebook feed sure. and check there. So um, thank you so much for being with us. And, thank you, Tanya. And thank you, yeah. everybody who's here with us. Okay. Goodbye. Bye-bye.